Good evening and welcome to TDM Talk Show. I'm your host, Kelsey Wilhelm. Our guest tonight is Graham Tier, an expert in facilities management with over 20 years experience in operations. He's also the chairman of the International Facility Management Association and the head of facility management for the Hong Kong Jockey Club. He's here in Macau as a part of a deal with the Macau Management Association in a strategic partnership to develop facilities management here. We're here to get some insights with Mr. Tier tonight. Good evening, thank you for being on the talk show. Thank you. So I wanted to start off and, and just ask, facility management, what is the importance of something like that in running an overall organization? Sure. Well, nowadays, organizations are investing millions of dollars and billions of dollars into infrastructure and development. And this uh, infrastructure has to be maintained. And so uh, facilities management is really about the ongoing operations of the people, the place and the technology in maintaining those assets. Now you are the, the chairman of the International uh, Facilities Management Association um, and it's, it's recently gotten more, uh, more of a standardization through the ISO standards. Um, those were implemented, was that just late last year? Correct. So we've now the, um, you know, there's an ISO standard, ISO 41000, which is regulating the, uh, the terminology around FM. So this gives better clarity to what facilities management is. Um, a little bit about IFMA, which is the International Facilities Management Association. We are a, an organisation covering the globe with the largest professional association for facilities managers. With uh, 24,000 members, uh, 16 uh, councils and also communities within IFMA. And uh, <clears throat> IFMA is really about bringing, we have members uh, that, that bring uh, you know, professional expertise together we have events uh, and marketing, and but most of all, we have training and development for the industry. And that's why this strategic partnership uh, with the Macau Management Association is really a, an important step. And through the strategic partnership, you're also giving people a chance to have a, an education and more of a, um, let's say, a through line in terms of their career, developing it. How, how exactly is that working? Yes, yeah, good question. Uh, at the moment, um, FM is, you know, in the US we're teaching FM in high school now and, and our aim is to make FM or facilities management the career of choice for the younger generation as they come through. A lot of people that are in FM really fell into the profession. They, they, they come from engineering backgrounds or, uh, you know, uh, cleaning services or security services and fell into FM. What we've done is we've formulated a strategic development framework which really gives a clear career path for anyone that wants to enter into FM. This is really an exciting time to be in FM. Um, the industry is a $1.1 trillion business. Okay? There's 25 million practitioners worldwide uh, working in FM and <clears throat> there's a serious uh, need for, for training and development of a very high standard and our programs are ISO and ANSI certified um, which means that, that you can guarantee the outcome of the quality of the, of the, of the applicant. In Macau we have, um, we're lucky enough to have some of these multi-billion dollar integrated resorts and very large scale properties mm -hmm. which require quite, um, quite extensive management. Uh, what, what are the advantages of then offering people more of a guideline towards how things should be standardized? Yeah, the the, those associations, or sorry, those organisations were actually present um, for, the, for the signing of the strategic partnering agreement with Macau uh, Management Association, along with, you know, some senior government um, support. And this is really important. When you start to implement training programs and development programs, you really need those organisations and the key stakeholders involved in this process. Um, for those organisations, they've invested billions of dollars into their, into their uh, facilities and they need to you know, recruit and train those staff uh, at a local level mm -hmm. and to make it sustainable. Um, and this is why we're so excited. Um, you know, Macau has a population of over 600,000 and um, not only that, we see, or well, IFMA sees Macau as playing a key role in training and development particularly in the Greater Bay Area um, as, as developments happen in Zhuhai and north of Zhuhai. Uh, in, in particular now we're seeing a lot of talent attraction programs, so do you think that the people, most of the trainees who are, are coming up in facilities management, do you picture them staying in Macau or do you think they'll try and procure other opportunities? I think there's, there's going to become a lot of opportunities in the great, Greater Bay Area, uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, we're seeing massive development uh, even uh, you know, last week I was in, in, in 
in Guangzhou. Mm -hmm. Some of the development in Guangzhou is significant. And the needs for skills and training in that area is, is critical. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a huge demand for it. And I think that uh, this proactive step by the Macau Management Association working together with IFMA is really a positive move. Mm -hmm. I mean, speaking of, uh, the, the mainland has very obviously large-scale facilities, Every, everything along the scale. You can find it in, in the mainland in terms of, of facilities. Uh, but you also oversee a huge facility in Hong Kong. Well, multiple facilities under the umbrella of the Hong Kong Jockey Club. Uh, 26,000 staff, um, 9 million square feet, comprising race courses, corporate, residential, recreational. Um, and then also there's a new, new development in the mainland, which is the Chong Wanu facilities. Yeah. Um, how, how involved were you in that project and, and how do you see its growth so far? Okay, so once again, a fantastic uh, project by the, by the club. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also uh, my involvement in that role was really around the FM and the establishment of the FM mm -hmm. uh, teams and systems uh, to run that site. Um, and so uh, it really started, my involvement started there after the Asian Games in 2010. And pretty much we handed over an operating model to the business uh, in May, uh, May last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you've seen some of the activities even recently, there's been activities on the site and it's so far it's been very positive and certainly a great move for the club. Now how, how does that add to the, the uh, let's say, complexity of managing the other facilities that you already have within the jockey club itself? I mean, that's one of the most, one of the largest and most complex asset portfolios. It requires a certain model of operation that cannot exactly be static. And you under, underwent a review of that, and you switched up the model in terms of moving from a cyclical model to a, a uniform condition-based model. Um, why, why exactly did you do that, and has it been efficient so far? Okay, so there's two aspects that you touched on there. First one is really about the move to integrated facilities management, which mm -hmm happened back in around 2010 where the jockey club uh, you know, traditionally had technical services and soft services separate. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2008, um, our, our now CEO uh, had the foresight to, to see that there were synergies in bringing those groups together and we formed FM in 2008 uh, with, the, with the generation of administration coming into technical services. We then further enhance that with the transformation of these services through uh, 2010 to 2012 mm -hmm. which meant we really looked at all the different services and how they were being delivered into the organization mm -hmm. and which was the most efficient and effective manner to deliver those services to the club we set up internal agreements and and also uh, we confirmed what those operating costs would be so almost mm -hmm. like no different to a third party would do for an organization when you outsourced fm mm -hmm. Then in 2012 to roughly 2014, we started to, you know, we had heavy investments in capital revitalization programs mm -hmm. through the facilities. And we saw the need to really look, um, take a fresh look at what we call asset health, mm -hmm. which is really the ongoing maintenance of these uh, assets and how do we maintain them? Uh, what format do we do that in? Do we do it on, like you said, uh, time-based? Or do we do it more on asset health? And when I talk about asset health, um, what, we, what we found is that um, some assets are operating in vastly different environments and different, um, have different pressures. So they might be operating 24 hours a day versus you know, six hours a day. Therefore, a cyclic approach is not necessarily the best approach when you're looking at assets. You really need to understand the environment in which the assets are in. So we do uh, what we call asset health, which is look at the cyclic requirements plus the actual physical condition of the assets before we make the replacement. Mm -hmm. And on average, uh, within the jockey club portfolio, which is huge, uh, we're doing um, over 300-odd over cyclic capital programs per year uh, in, in the different asset groups. It's almost which, one every day. Yeah, which is really, you know, we've got, uh, the club has, a, the, I suppose, the privilege of different asset mm -hmm. types or what we call clusters corporate clusters, residential clusters, mm -hmm. and then special uses like the race courses and these sorts of clusters. So each of those groups have to be treated differently. <clears throat> each of those groups require different planning and different prioritization. And so this is all part of the asset health plan. And these models can be applied into Macau, can be applied really anywhere that uh, you've got infrastructure or, or built environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a recent project that has come online and which is offering more of a, uh, more of a uh, cultural and creative 
uh, environment, and it was a joint project between the Jockey Club as well as the, the Hong Kong government. Yeah. Um, that was the Central Police Station. Correct. Um, how do you feel about the project? Are you, you proud of how the, the project has come about so far? And, and what were some of the main hurdles to overcome in, in setting up and executing the project? Right. Uh, it's an amazing project. And uh, I think for all those that have been involved, congratulations. It's been a really amazing project. I can still recall uh, my first visit to Central Police Station, which is uh, back in uh, you know, 2008, uh, when we went there to, to basically do some reconnaissance before we took over the site. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously the project team come in uh, to do the, the major uh, refurbishment <coughs> or uh, revitalization as we call it. And um, our role back then, FM's role back then, was to help advise <coughs> on how do, you, how do you put the infrastructure in place, the modern technology, into a heritage building. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things that we were brought in to do. <coughs> Excuse me. That's something that's very relevant for Macau as well. We we've have a, a number of heritage properties and we have UNESCO listed heritage properties that are, we're also seeking new, new redevelopment opportunities for them, the, the central library being one of the, the new cases of that. So it's interesting to see a, a heritage property being properly revamped. Okay, so the, the key factor here, and this is what the Jockey Club does well, mm -hmm. is they bring the operator in early, they bring the facilities management team in early uh, to help advise on the infrastructure planning. So what we call the schematic design is done with FM's involvement. Okay. We then let the project team get on with the, 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 the new build and then we come back for the testing and commissioning okay. and then we start the operations. Mm -hmm. So we'll, you know, we form the teams for the technical services, we form the teams for landscaping, cleaning, uh, security, whatever it may be in, in the case of Central Police Station, it was a whole full integrated facilities management model for that operation. Mm -hmm. So, and now the site's up and running, very well received by public, um, and um, I think everyone who's been involved should be very proud of that job. Now, you've, you've been with the Jockey Club for approximately 14 and a half years, correct? Yeah, correct. And, um, but you you've have tw obviously 20 years experience in operations, you've worked with some major, major corporations. Uh, what brought you to Hong Kong? Okay, I think um, the when, when I was recruited actually into the club, they were looking to bring about transformation or change uh, originally on the technical services side. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I bought was a level of expertise in systems and planning. Um, and so implementation of things like Maximo and maintenance management systems, uh, the implementation of, of processes, uh, the structuring and formation of teams that, you know, that have a shared common goal and that work together to deliver the end result. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, my technical background together with my people management skills um, is, is, is why I believe I've been successful. And the club to me was a huge opportunity because it had such a, you know, a large portfolio mm -hmm. um, and there was a need to, to make these improvements. At the time, who's now our CEO, our CEO is very passionate about the club, mm -hmm. very passionate about uh, he, you know, the, the, where we're taking the organisation. Um, and so it's been a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to work with him on the journey. Uh, in terms of FM in Hong Kong, over the course of the time that you've been there, have you seen, obviously you came in with a new approach and you were, uh, you were hired specifically to offer your expertise. Have you seen an overall evolution of the concept of how facilities management is done in Hong Kong over the course of the time that you've been there? Definitely. Um, you know, when I first come to Hong Kong, uh, the, the concept was more around property management. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing the name and the word facilities management everywhere, globally. Mm -hmm. People are starting to identify this is a profession, mm -hmm. just like a doctor or a professor, yeah. right? This is a profession. Um, China, I was pleased to see that China was one of the 26 participating uh, countries on the ISO formation for FM. Mm -hmm. This is a great step. Um, and so to answer your question, yes, FM is, continues to involve. Um, the support for FM is huge and we're now working locally with uh, the, the, develop, the uh, Development Council in Hong Kong mm -hmm. to see how we can further develop the training uh, programs for FM in Hong Kong as well. Given that the ISO is so recent, is this, um, is this kind of the preliminary stage in which we can still, we can see, let's say, uh, even more exponential change within how FM is, is managed in Hong Kong now that there is a standardized ISO? I think it'll take time mm -hmm. is, is the answer. Um, and 
But I sit back and I, not, I don't sit back, but I see what's happening in China mm -hmm. and I see the rapid development in China. And, I, and, and, and I, when I attend events and seminars within China, these guys are hungry for information. Mm -hmm. They're fast to learn and they want to know what's the latest technology. And so I think we, we, we shouldn't rest on our laurels, okay? We need to stay ahead of the game. Things like the internet of things, technology is moving so rapidly, AI is coming into the workplace. We're seeing this and, and, and we shouldn't rest on our laurels. Now you have extensive experience within China. You've obviously been in the region for quite some time. And you'd, you'd previously mentioned that the, in terms of the market of China, the nature of the market is fundamentally different than fully mature markets like the US and Europe. Um, what, what exactly do you mean by that statement and has anything changed since you made that statement? Okay, so obviously China's going through a rapid growth, yes. um, has been going through rapid growth. Um, and the development of almost cities, okay, mm -hmm. um, are happening on a daily basis in, 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 that, in that area. Mm -hmm. And there's different pockets within China yes. that are developing faster than other areas. I think there's a huge opportunity with the Greater Bay uh, mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, how that's led, I think we're, it's too early to, to really talk about that. Yeah. But what I would say is that each area within the Greater Bay, from my experience and what I've seen, they've, they've all got different things that they can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And Macau can play a really, a really important role, particularly with respect to training and development. Hong Kong has you know, a lot of benefits and, and skill sets that it can bring to the table. But likewise, these skill sets are in China as well. So we need to look at how each of the parties can play that role. And the key here is to work collaboratively, mm -hmm. to work as one team in, you know, in the Greater Bay. How that comes about, I think that's up to the leadership to, to work out. But um, certainly, there's a huge opportunity. Now, IFMA itself has its own, if, correct me if I'm wrong, it has its own director for China. It does, yeah. And um, so how does that work in terms of uh, let's say partnering up with other similar associations which are in facilities management. Okay, um, so we don't have any other strategic partnership agreements in uh, China as such. Uh, we do in, in Macau and the reason we did it in Macau just we don't want fragmentation in this industry. One of the biggest problems with FM on a global platform is its fragmentation. Mm -hmm. We're trying to eliminate that and so we don't want another association in Macau to deliver FM so therefore we partner with the leading, uh, the leading association. Likewise, into Japan or into Korea, uh, we are partnering with JAFMA and we're partnering with the, you know, the Korean associations there because you don't want to reinvent the wheel and you don't want to create f confusion to the market. Um, the US is a very stable market. FM's been in place since the 1980s. Um, very well established, very well known. Um, and I've just come back from three weeks through the US looking at all the different areas of FM and, and what's happening there and it's really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. Likewise, uh, next month I'm in Europe uh, for World Workplace Europe with IFMA, um, which is about bringing together the European countries or the European uh, um, players in FM to talk about what is the strategy, what is the way forward, how are we going to embrace the ISO 41000 standard mm -hmm. and how are we going to deliver IFM unitedly as one group as opposed to this fragmentation with everyone trying to capture the market. And I mean you, you are lucky enough that you get to travel quite extensively and you get to see the uniqueness of, of each market or each nation or, or the way that each let's say even company and enterprise itself chooses. Uh, do you think that there's value in kind of cherry picking? The, uh, the most successful parts of things that, sh that you see either in emerging markets, already s well established markets, do you think that that's something that under the umbrella of IFMA there's, there's advantage in that? There is an advantage and that's what we do by bringing our members together globally they can, they can cherry pick. What I would say is that the, the speed at which these uh, countries are developing, mm -hmm. okay let's take India for example, mm -hmm. um, Tha uh, Thailand, um, you know, even Vietnam for that matter, mm -hmm. uh, they all, and China, they all develop at different rates. Mm -hmm. The take up is at different rates yes. and it relies a lot on the government direction. Mm -hmm. If the government's assertive and says, I want to embrace FM, mm -hmm. then it happens. And we've seen the Chinese government, they've signed the, 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 the treaty for ISO, right? They've embraced FM and it's going to happen. 
And uh, so I think that's half the, the challenge in implementing these systems in these countries. In, uh, in regards to the 2021 strategic plan, um, we're, we're getting close. <laughs> uh, what, are, what are some of the key elements that you're looking at or that you're excited about? Okay, so uh, the key elements there are around membership, mm -hmm. um, strategic events, mm -hmm. uh, collaboration within the industry, um, and obviously organization, uh, our own organization, making sure that the, the operation is delivering to its members and its key stakeholders what it needs to deliver to stay relevant. Um, you know, professional associations, if they can't remain relevant, then they won't have a membership base. Mm -hmm. uh, they won't uh, have a voice in, the, in, in, in government and they won't have a, a seat at the table uh, when it comes to policy making and decision making. So I think the board's job, uh, and as the chairman of the, of the board, is to make sure that we stay focused and keeping IFMA relevant to our members and stakeholders. The, in regards to the, um, to the Macau, uh, the recently signed agreement with Macau, um, how exactly did that come about? What was the process? Uh, how long has the process been going on? When did the, the dialogue start? Okay. We've had a very long relationship with Macau. Um, and like in this region, um, you've worked in this region as well, similar, similar time to me. It's about trust. Mm -hmm. And these relationships have formed over years. And uh, the Macau Management Institution or the Macau Management Association as such, um, that relationship with IFMA goes back many years. And so um, when we're looking for a partner to deliver the training programs into this region, mm -hmm. we want someone we can trust. And that's, that's why we turn to them. Um, so yeah, it gets, goes back a long way. In regards to uh, trust is a very key part here. And, and obviously Macau and Hong Kong being uh, Hong Kong is, you know, over 7 million people. Macau is over 600 some thousand. Uh, the mainland is a much other, much larger beast yeah. that, that is more splintered, that is more fragmented. But has uh, IFMA identified any main group that it is thinking of, of working with? That is, how is the move into the mainland, the continue move into the mainland going? And is there any strategic partner? Any organisation that moves into the mainland China mm -hmm. has to do so with a certain amount of caution mm -hmm. and also understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it doesn't matter which organisation that is. Um, when you start to work in a different environment, you need to first of all understand that environment. So our director in China, uh, mm -hmm. who's based in Shanghai, uh, she understands the market. Mm -hmm. uh, she's worked in that market for many years, and our formation of the chapter model which is now we've got chapters in Guangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and with the support of Macau Management Institute, we will launch chapters into another three southern, uh, southern uh, China regions. Now, will those be Greater Bay Area cities? or will Two of them will be Greater Bay. Okay. okay. Um, and so whether or not we launch a Greater Bay chapter, I'm not sure at this stage, mm -hmm. because we've still got a very strong Hong Kong chapter mm -hmm. with over 600 members there. Uh, so we need to think about how, how that pans out in the long term. Um, but with respect to China, I think we need to make sure we get it right. Um, you know, protect our intellectual property with respect to training and development. Mm -hmm. uh, it all has to be delivered in simplified Chinese, as you'd, as you'd appreciate. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of work in translation and then online exams to be done. But we're doing it and we're making good progress. How is the new media aspect coming in with that? Obviously, uh, things like WeChat and, and all of that are kind of overturning how traditional communication is happening. Is that one of the key avenues that you guys are also looking at? We are. I think um, whenever you're dealing with membership organizations or associations, mm -hmm. the biggest challenge is really making sure they're getting the message. And um, there's no better way to do that than face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've seen a trend or a change in the US, the way they're communicating now on issues. Um, I'm not sure that's always the best way to communicate, but certainly face-to-face, uh, -face, wherever possible, get out, meet the chapters, meet the members, and find out what the concerns are and how can we improve the environment for them or, or, the, or the way forward. Um, coming, coming from a, a macro to a micro and, and going back to, to Hong Kong, just because it's, it's such an impressive uh, amount of assets and, and such an impressive scale that you have to handle in terms of the, the management of the jockey club facilities themselves. Of the different areas, of the nine million square feet that includes the race courses, the residential, is there any part that is more complicated 
Mm. I think when you look at assets in total, uh, mm. when you look at portfolios, you need to, the, one of the first things I say to people is you really need to understand the appetite for risk. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and certain assets, there is zero tolerance for, for risk. Uh, data centers, data center infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, these sorts of things, there is no tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, they have to work and they have to work 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So depending on the assets, what I would say to you is depending on the, the, the particular assets and what their functionality is, that's the first step in identifying where you really need to focus your energy on. Because mm -hmm. um, you can't do everything. And um, you know, in the Jockey Club's case, there's 31,000 uh, property related assets. Mm -hmm. And so you need to focus on the key ones first. Now, Hong Kong has gone through a, a skyrocket in terms of housing prices, residential, um, just land prices in general. Does, has that increase made it more volatile in terms of the management of the assets? Do you have to have more of your finger on the pulse because of that increase in price? I don't think that's impacted the, the maintainability of the buildings um, or, or that aspect, to be honest with you. I think we could do better in that area. Uh, but that will require regulation to a certain extent. We're seeing some of it with you know, the work being done by government on unauthorised building works and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But I, I think there's still some challenges there with the owners and corporations and the way that these buildings are managed um, or have been managed in the past and that will require some changes and hopefully we can get that right on the newer buildings mm -hmm. uh, as we bring the new stock on board or we do um, you know, these urban renewal projects, mm -hmm. then we look at different ways of managing the portfolio or the assets where it's not left to the individual owners to determine whether or not they want to fix a sporting concrete issue. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's mandated that they have to you know, okay. provide it. So I, th you know, I think there's some opportunity for improvement there. Um, certainly if the companies, uh, the, you know, the big companies that own the assets themselves, they're very conscientious in making sure their public image is right. But it's these smaller assets that are the ones that we still need to improve on, I would say. In, in terms of, out of curiosity, in terms of the CPS, the Central Police Station project, was it always destined to be a contemporary art and leisure hub? How, was that always the main decision? How, how was that yeah. choice of use come about? I think, sure, that was the original intent, but it, it has evolved. Things, things always evolve, right? Um, was it exactly as it was planned back in 2007 and 2008? Absolutely not. I don't think anything in the world was. <laughs> so I think things evolve. And um, all I can tell you is that from my experience and my uh, you know, direct involvement in that project, what's evolved to what you've got there now as a public offering is fantastic. Uh, the way that we've got you know, the 22 arts and heritage areas uh, for performing arts and, 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 and these sort of things is really spectacular. Mm -hmm. Um, there's always a balance, isn't there? Um, how do you create revenue to sustain the assets but not go overboard? Mm -hmm. So there's always a balance. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see more of that. You've got one of the largest developments in Hong Kong, uh, cultural hub, West Kowloon. Mm -hmm. um, you've now got Kai Tak development as well happening. Mm -hmm. um, how are these infrastructures going to be maintained? Where's the funding coming for the, the infrastructure? These are going to be questions that need to be answered by the operators, right? So I think having a sustainable model is very important. How you get that uh, or how that evolves over time is, is also important. Looking at some of the, the larger institutions within Macau, uh, sustainability has, has come into the, let's say, spotlight, let's say more over the past five, ten years than it had been initially. Um, in terms of the, the approach, do you, do you find that Macau and Hong Kong have similar approaches when it comes to facilities management or is Macau's evolving? Is any of them more advanced or are they both still on the same path? I think there's two parts to what, you, what you're asking. The first one is around sustainability. I think with new development, um, you know, you look for the latest technology, you look for the innovative ways to do things, okay? Um, and I see that here in Macau. Some of the new developments that, that have been done are state of the art. Mm -hmm. Their involvement in lead or, or their, their, their ability to integrate lead um, mm -hmm. into the design from a sustainability perspective and adopt those best practices are there. It's a lot harder when the stock is old, yes. okay, because you've got to do retrofitting and whatever else. So Hong Kong has a challenge like that, whereas Macau was really 
undergone tremendous growth over the years. Um, and so it's a lot easier with new stock. So on the sustainability front, I would say uh, it's great to see both economies working on that. There's some serious challenges around waste recycling mm -hmm. for both uh, Hong Kong and, and Macau that need to be tackled. And it needs government really to, to drive the policies and to drive the infrastructure for that. Mm -hmm. The second uh, part you asked with, with respect to FM and you know, what's more advanced or what's more, um, you know, is there any, any leader, dominant leader? I would say both Hong Kong and Macau are doing well in that front. And Macau's had the advantage of some US influence, yes. okay? Uh, and so that Western leadership has given them uh, uh, some advantages over the way they manage their assets. And because they've basically taken things that they've learned from the US and, and adopted them here locally. In Hong Kong, the big players, um, you know, they've also adopted best practice FM. And so I think there's the, the both, uh, both countries are working towards it. I think it, from my perspective as the global chair of IFMA, we can do more, we can always do more. Um, and, um, but from what I've seen with this signing of the strategic partner agreement uh, with, the, with Macau and the attendance and the support from these organisations in Macau today, I'm very impressed. Uh, their commitment is there. Uh, they want to deliver training, they want to improve the workforce, the local workforce, and this is a, a great sign. Well, I look forward to seeing how it evolves, and uh, we hope to see you back in Macau sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thank you again for being on the show. Yeah. Cheers. That's all for this week. We'll see you again next week for more TDM Talk Show. Thank you. Good night.